Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mix Tank Live from PureMix.com. My name is Mark Abrams, and I'm joining you here uh, pretty much every other Monday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time to review tracks that are uploaded to Mix Tank. Mix Tank is our think tank for mixing engineers on PureMix, where you can upload your mix and get comments and feedback from members of the PureMix community. Some of the mentors pop in there once in a while, and then we do these live events where we comment live while we all listen on YouTube. Cool thing about this is that it's a live event, and I've got my friends up here in the chat room that are helping me out. Make sure you keep an eye on the comments that are floating by on YouTube as well, because the community is chiming in along with me while I do this, which is super cool. Uh, recent news on pure mix if you haven't seen it yet we have a new video with luca predalesi mixing a diplo track which is unbelievable luca has all kinds of cool tricks in there one of my favorites is uh how he uses the rock ruble sidechain ones to um do a compression thing on the mix range in the mid or the mid range in the mix bus and uh that's one that i've stolen since then on a couple of mixes and it's been working well for me so Definitely check that out. Uh, Luca's approach is incredible. It's a hybrid analog digital thing and uh, it, it's just killer. So definitely check that video out. Uh, stuff that we have on the horizon. We have new videos coming from Vance Powell. We have new mentors coming to the platform. All kinds of stuff. There's a start to finish with Andrew Sheps on the horizon. So keep an eye out there as well. So, all right, without any further delay, let's jump right into this thing. I've got Mixed Tank pulled up. And uh, one way that we do this is everybody who shows up to the live stream to, to be a part of this, I try to get to your tracks first. So if you're here, make sure you drop your username on Mixtank and the song name that you'd like us to check out today live in the YouTube comments above. And uh, we'll, we'll try to get to it before the end of the day. So I've got one from Flandy Bob who's here in the chat with us. This song is called Old Soul Rock and Roll and we're going to jump right in. So here we go.
Nice one, man. Great way to start it off. That's killer. Um, yeah, this, this thing's sounding great. So, uh, looking over at the comments here, it says, uh, this is a second mix. I tried to improve the drum dynamics and played a bit with the guitar panning. The background of it is it's a multi-track from 2007 recorded with my previous band in a garage, four mics on the drums, DI bass, 57 on guitar, a pod and a cheap T-bone or something on the vocals uh, that I recovered recently. So recorded at 1644 because I didn't know any better then. Sounds good, though. Uh, lyrics make absolutely no sense. Hopefully we can retract that at some point. Or not. You know, just go for it. <laughs> um, awesome. Yeah, I, I felt that everything sounded really good in here. The tones are all good, and uh, especially just for having four mics and everything. Sometimes it's all you need. Sounds cool. Um, okay, a couple notes. For me, the uh, the guitars have like a little bit of an upper mid range um, sort of slant that's causing them to kind of poke out of the speakers, but um, not in like a balanced sort of way. So, two two approaches you could go to that. With one is like, can I tame down the top end of it? But another way, which I think you would benefit from, is if you boosted some of the low mid body in those guitars and tried to bring some of their their meat back. Um, and then if things get a little dark. Uh, there's a number of tricks that you can do to kind of bring them back to life. And a video on Pure Mix that I recommend checking out is Daryl Thorpe mixing the DGs. He does a, a trick in there where he's got enough meat going in the low mid of the guitars that they still feel punchy and like they're they're round and big. Uh, and then to get some of the top end back, he does like a slight um, shelving thing at like 10K or something like that just to bring some of the presence back. But uh, Foo Fighters, you know, you can't really go wrong with like checking out some of their tricks for guitar tones and everything. So definitely check that video out. Um, and yeah, I just I look around like if I was mixing it, my brain would go to an API 550 at 220 and just doing a couple clicks just to see if I can get some some of the meat back in the guitar. I think that's also going to make them a little bit more 3D and help uh, kind of push forward and also add some some power to the track. Um, they're not overly harsh or overly brittle, but I think just giving it a little bit more balance in the low end or uh, yeah, low low frequency spectrum is going to help bring those to life a little bit. The snare, I thought, sounds really good. Like, everything sounds pretty cool. It sounds like there's a lot of under snare on there. Um, so maybe there's a little EQ bump that you could do in the low mids of that, too. Uh, the only other thing I had for that was that the attack time might be a little fast on the snare. And it's keeping all of those transients really parked in place. Um, but I'm not feeling a whole lot of life come out of the snare either. So maybe a slightly slower attack time on that, but it's not, not a huge thing. None of these are huge things, honestly. I thought that the balance was great. I can hear everything. The bass guitar is nice and powerful, which sometimes gets lost on tracks like these. So great job there. I love the dynamic push that happens naturally at 130. And, uh, everything else from here, I believe is just, uh, all automation comments. So... One thing I might try, like, uh, it's the slippery fader trick, as uh, Rick Rubin calls it, or um, Chefs has referred to it as that as well. But you could try just automating the master. So when you go into these bigger sections, you just give it like a, a bump, like, you know, half dB, a dB, or something, just to lift the whole section and keep the power moving throughout the song. I felt a nice one happen at 130, and it was like that could be emphasized even just a hair more. That might be kind of cool. The other thing uh, with automation too would just be adding some dynamics to these sections. So when we go into verse two, for example, it might be cool if the bass comes down and those guitars come down uh, as things kind of, you know, duck out of place to, to make a little space in the arrangement for the lyric, bring everybody down a little bit to really put the spotlight on the vocal. Uh, with the vocal, the compression is standard for a rock affair. Like um, if there's parallel compression going on the vocal, sometimes to um, give a breath in the dynamic of the song, I'll pull the parallel compression back just a hair and let it breathe a little bit more, take out some of the aggression, and then bring that back on the chorus as well. That can help for a lift on it. Um, the uh, only other thing would just be like maybe a little vocal automation throughout, just to like, just like I was saying on the verses, maybe pulling back just a hair so it's a little less in your face and like things get to breathe a little bit more and then letting it come back up on those sections. The last thing I had was on the solo section for the bass around 306. Um, maybe uh, I could use a little bit of EQ automation just to take some of the low mid kind of rumble, the muddiness out of it. Just so while it's by itself, it feels nice and uh, mid range focused, like it's it's present, but not boomy or muffled. And then letting it go back to its regular state in the chorus because everything felt really good there. That's all I got. It's a great song. Great job, Flandy. Um, very cool. Awesome. 
Uh, Superior, Drummer 3, Tracker, and Slate Trigger helped the drums a lot. Nice. So you did some sample replacement and everything on it. That's cool. Uh, it sounds really cool. Thanks for uh, starting us off with that one. All right. Our next one is from the one and only Mike Ornsby. So his song is called Nighttime Dreaming with the Loons. And uh, let's read some of these comments here. So I took a resonator guitar instrumental that I tweaked a bit, then tweaked a bit more. Um, with advice, especially from Tom Foolery, the man, the myth, um, the legend. This was originally recorded with an external mic on a resonator cone and a humbucker neck pickup. So the external on the resonator caught the acoustic part of the piece, while the humbucker pick through a guitar amp caught the amplified sound, then bleeded or then I blended them together. This was overlaid with the track of a field recording made one night on a northern lake surrounded by loons calling back and forth. Amazing. Uh, I thought the resonator tones complemented the loon calls well and adjusted the levels to best complement each other. Awesome. All right, let's check it out. So here we go from the beginning. I'm going to click on HD because why not? And here we are. Beautiful, as always. Uh, the resonator sounds incredible. Great playing um, overall. You always have a way of uh, invoking emotion with, with all the pieces that you put up and um, also making them sound Atmos right off the top, as, as always. Uh, but yeah, it sounds, uh, it sounds incredible. The, um, I agree with Tom's comment about maybe you could do a little bit of a, a dip at 200, 220 um, in the resonator just to open the body up just a little bit. Um, but it's not, it's not 
imperative either, just like Tom says on here. Uh, the only other thing that I had was um, with the loop of balloons. Um, they are happening very often, so maybe maybe a couple less calls, or if you have other calls in the field recording that you could replace some of those with, just to add some variation to it so it doesn't feel um, so consistent or so uh, repetitive on it. So um, yeah, I think it would make some more space to listen to that guitar too and not be as focused on the loons, which are much louder than the guitar. Uh, but overall, it's great. The uh, only other suggestion I had was, you know, if, if that was the loon call that you have happening a lot in there, if that is the only one that's available or if they're all just sounding like that, maybe you could do some things to kind of switch it up and automate the position of that, the level of that, um, even the, the tonal balance of it. So you can make it go darker or, uh, or louder, just to add some variation to it. Um, and sometimes doing a little bit of pitch stuff uh, or elastic audio might be too audible on that, but that would be another another option. Is just what could you do to make that uh, a little bit more unique as it goes along and less of a loop feel? But overall, it feels great and it um, definitely invokes emotion. And as uh, let's see, um, Brad, I believe said somewhere, uh, you could sell this song into a tin can. So there you go. Yeah, and definitely that's that's a great library piece. Very cool. Thanks for submitting that. As always, awesome, Mike. Okay, uh, let's see what else we got here. We got Keith Warman, Sergeant Cable. Click on our 8D and let's check it out. Uh, let's see, just a couple notes on the thing. So it was my pleasure to produce and arrange this patriotic and um, uplifting anthem about our beloved veterans who have lost loved ones in service to their respective countries. Once again, I sequenced the string section to create an emotional push here along with the drums, perk, and bass, and piano. Second edition of the mix based on some helpful suggestions. Ah, footnote, I used the new Comp 2 by Process Audio on the vocal and bass for this mix. I love what it does. Me too. That thing's awesome. All right, here we go. I'm a genuine American of the red, white, and blue. I've got everything to gain and I've got everything to lose. And I'd give it all for you. Today I am a soldier. Tomorrow will be the same. And I'll fight beside my brothers. And that won't ever change. But through the blood, sweat, and tears, I learn to be a man. Only thing beneath my boots is this damn Afghanistan. I'm a genuine American. I serve the red, white, and blue. I've got everything to gain and I've got everything to lose. And I'd give it all.
Awesome job. What a string arrangement there at the end. That's beautiful. Nice work. Um, okay, cool. Uh, great job. And the drums sound killer. Those are, those are really awesome tones. Um, the first thing that jumped out at me was the compression on the drums overall and the vocals. So I don't know if there's a drum bus compressor going on. Sounds like things are being kind of slammed in um, ultra compression, bringing up all the noise floor and all of the, the, the sustain of the drums and everything that's going on there. Not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it definitely adds to the epicness of this. If that was in parallel and you had, um, you know, if you have a mix control on that or you had a way to just dial some of that back, I think it would let the drums breathe a little bit more uh, and also eliminate some of the sustain that's happening in them. So one thing um, to always listen for with compression, reverb, compression, anything that's uh, working on timing um, is just how it's affecting the groove of the track. So as you compress the drum bus much more, you're bringing up all that sustain, which means you're making the notes longer on each of the drums. So if you have um, a kick drum that's that's extenuating and, and really long, this one's not long, it's nice and tight and punchy, but um, if the kick drum's longer, the snare drum's longer, the toms are, are bleeding out for you know a bar, um, that can change the, the overall tightness of the track, the groove of it, and, and just kind of make things not feel as tight as they might have been performed. I heard that on the bass guitar as well, where um, it feels like it might be living in compression land with a slow release and slowly coming up, making those extended, uh, those notes just kind of drag out a little bit longer. And uh, the way that the player naturally had those going, if you bring up too much of that stuff or sustain the note too far, it could affect the, the groove relationship between the drums and the bass. So it sounded to me like a little bit of that stuff was going on. I wonder what this would sound like with a little bit less compression or less of a heavy hand on it. And then uh, with the vocals as well, it felt like the vocals um, were getting some EQ and tonal uh, artifacts from over compression. So just like some of the resonances of the vocal uh, we're being drug out a little bit and creating a little bit of muddiness on it. That's something where it might be cool to um, work in parallel instead of on the insert compression. And uh, with that, you can also get a little more control about bringing the vocal forward or backwards in the mix. Um, easier to hear on speakers for this kind of stuff, but uh, the vocals felt like they were a little bit recessed to me. And if it was in parallel, you could kind of um, park the vocal and then use the parallel fader to kind of um, have that vocal kind of move to the front in the mix a little bit. And I think that that would, that would help bring some clarity around that and have a little bit more emphasis on the lyric of the song, which is so important in this one. Um, that was kind of all I had. I thought the strings all sounded great. It was just uh, overall just watch out for compression stuff. I think as you loosen that compression up, uh, if you do on the, on the drum bus, uh, that's going to change your balance pretty drastically in this case. Uh, the kick felt like it was a little bit too forward in front of the vocal sometimes, so you might have to rebalance if you do loosen up that compression. But overall, I think that this is sounding great, and it's uh, definitely one of those cases where like you could pop into this mix for you know 15 minutes and make a couple tweaks, and and you might feel a little bit more attached to the groove of the song. Um, and you can always do a save as and just try it. So that's cool. But yeah, it's sounding great, and uh, yeah. Awesome job. Well, well crafted, well uh, produced as well. Nice work. And yeah, that string arrangement at the end is beautiful. Okay. Let's, uh, let's see what else we got. Thanks for submitting that. Very cool. That was from Keith Warman. All right. Our next one is going to be from Brad Heck. And if you guys are here with me in the chat and you've got some songs to review, uh, drop them in the comments down below and we'll get to them. Here we go. Tell you I've been racking my brain Hoping to find a way out I've had enough of this continual rain Changes are coming, no doubt It's been a too long time With no peace of mind and I'm ready for the times to get better mm -hmm. 
You seem to want from me what I cannot give I feel so lonesome sometimes I have a dream that I wish I could live It's burning holes in my mind It's been a too long time With no peace of mind And I'm ready for the times to get better Amazing, Brad. This is crazy. Guys, come on. We're like three or four songs in and everything's great. This is awesome. We're not going to need to do these anymore. <laughs> um, awesome job. So uh, just, a, just a couple comments, but overall, this, this is really, really, really great. Um, I agree a lot with uh, Tom's comments, as, as I pretty much always do. Um, the, uh, the snare, the first one for me is that the, um, the snare is very close. So it's sitting... Depth wise to me, the snare sitting right with the vocal, um, sometimes just a hair in front of it. And I think if you pulled that back, as uh, Tom suggested here, I think that that's going to really, really put a spotlight on the vocal again and just kind of make that really the, the thing that your ear is glued to, um, which would be a great thing because this singer sounds awesome. Uh, other than that, let's see, uh, stereo widening felt like it was a little bit pushed into extreme uh, amounts for me. So I was feeling things kind of wrap around my head in an unnatural way, just a little bit. It's not way over the top, but I think you could pull it back and just add a little bit, um, just get a little bit more focus on the entire track by doing that. Sometimes when you uh, stretch out the stereo field too with a lot of compression, um, you can kind of feel like all of the in-between stuff of uh, the acoustic, like just the, the mic noise of the room and everything like that. It just kind of, makes that stuff a little bit more apparent and brings it forward a little bit. Um, so like the compression combined with uh, the phase tricks of doing some stereo widening on that can kind of make all of that just kind of cloudy up the picture a little bit. So it just kind of messes up the painting. Um, so I, I play around and see if you can dial that back and still get the effect that you're achieving uh, with those guitars. Um, they're going to be wide to me. They're going to be wide natural because of how you have them set up. Um, and I don't know that the widening's really enhancing the song that much uh, to to focus on the message and the and the clear vocal picture that's happening in there. Uh, there was some timing things that I heard on the percussive guitar that comes in over on the right side around 220. Um, that is an awesome part, especially in there with the snare. I'd lock it in just a little bit more. And uh, for editing stuff, I generally don't like to do elastic audio type editing on a guitar part like that. Um, 
or any kind of like quantizing stuff where it's, you know, doing warp markers and, and pulling things into place. I would go in and just slice up the waveform and see if you can just kind of nudge things around. It doesn't have to be note by note. Um, sometimes just like slicing a bar and then moving it around a little bit, putting that waveform up next to the snare and just seeing where you can get it in close and then repairing the edit and seeing if the groove feels a little bit better there. That was the only spot that it really jumped out at me. Um, but because it's such a minimalist piece, I feel like every note really matters and the timing of that's really important. So I'd check that out. Last comment was I heard some mouth click stuff around 250. It's a section where the band pulls back and the vocalist is just by themselves. Sometimes people like mouth clicks because it feels intimate. Um, to me, it always kind of pulls me out of the narrative and breaks the fourth wall. So I play around with um, just cleaning that up a little bit. Isotope mouth key clicker is amazing for that. Uh, default settings, you can just go across that section, pop it in, and uh, it'll wipe that stuff out really, really um, transparently. So yeah, that might be something to check out. But those are all very tiny comments, and that sounded incredible. So great job. Thank you for putting that up there. All right, we got another one in from Smoke and Fudo, Frozen Waltz. So we're going to pull that up. Guys, if you're here and you have a track up on Mixup that you'd like me to review, please drop it in those YouTube comments below. And we'll hit that before we move on to uh, people who might not be here. So, okay, so Smoking Fudo. Thanks for being here today. Always good to see you in there. All right, pop it into HD, and here we go. Sorry, I'm going to pause there because Brad just made a comment about the uh, the snare. So he said that the mic is on the brushes, not the snare. I'll do uh, a dB and a half down at the trim. Um, one other thing I wanted to throw out for that, Brad, just uh, when I saw your comment. Sometimes um, an EQ move can also kind of pull it back. And uh, the thing that I always go to for that is like if you think about, you know, if somebody's talking to you in the same room uh, as they're, you know, if they're like two, three feet away from you, their voice sounds drastically different. If then if they're like a couple more feet back, right? Like if they walk back further in the room, some of the high end goes away, some of the low end goes away. Um, generally, just like a more uh, pulled in frequency spectrum of that, right? So I, that kind of stuff always creeps into my head whenever I'm just out in the world or whatever, just listening to the differences that happen as somebody moves away from me or if I'm talking across the kitchen from somebody versus if we're standing right next to each other at the kitchen counter, that kind of stuff. Um, despite reverb changes and all that that happens in the room. But yeah, if you if you dim back some of the detail on that snare, it would also have the same effect as putting it right behind the vocal. The vocal has more high end. It's naturally going to feel like it's closer to me than something that's a little bit more rolled off in, in the back. Um, low end also has the same effect, obviously. If something's really muffly, it doesn't really sound far away. So not a huge change there, but just want to throw that out there. Sorry to interrupt. All right, back to smoking food over here. Here we go.
Awesome. Okay, cool. I just wanted to check dynamic range out toward the end there. Um, man, great job, Mirko. Uh, this is awesome. What a cool piece. Well, well put together too. I could see this doing really well in library music or something too. Um, I don't have a whole lot of comments for this. It sounds really good to me. The uh, dynamic range is possibly a bit much. I don't know what the end goal of this piece is, but uh, if this was going to be a, a library piece, if you think about the audio engineer that might have to mix this into something, that much dynamic range is going to cause him to do some extra work. And uh, I spent a couple years working in a post house doing uh, mixing for, um, you know, basically doing audio for video and putting stuff like this together. And I would, I was also like a music supervisor and had to choose pieces like that. Ones where I thought there was going to be a lot of extra work sometimes got left on the back burner uh, unless the piece of music was just the perfect fit or whatever, then you do whatever you got to do. But um, if it was the choice between this and something sounds slightly like it, the dynamic range is out of control. Um, if I was like overwhelmed by it when it was put in, if I had it playing while I was, you know, doing emails or something like that, uh, that might cause a negative reaction versus the emotional reaction that you're going in for it. But it all depends on your final use case scenario. So that's just like a side thought that I had there. Something to think about. Um, however, you don't want to lose that dynamic push at the end because it feels awesome. So I would just consider like, does it need to be as big? Is it comfortable for the listener? Uh, if this was in a theater, you want dynamics like that. And that's great. So uh, take that for what it's worth. The last thing I had about the, the loud section at the end here, and this might resolve your dynamic range issue as well. The vocals have a really peaky resonance around 3K that um, sounds like a whistle tune, right? So if you were to take um, an EQ and put on, uh, put it on the vocals of that and just bandpass, listen to like between 1K and maybe 7K or something like that, you're going to hear that whistle tone popping out of the speakers. And I think that that's causing a lot of apparent loudness. Um, that like, while the listener might be like, oh, I hear a resonance at 3K, it sounds like a whistle tone or something like that. They might, you know, feel like, oh, this is loud and harsh. If you take care of that resonance, the whole thing might be more smooth and might not have as much apparent loudness at the end either. Uh, so that might be something to check out. But yeah, the biggest thing I heard in that entire thing was just the vocal resonance at the end. And I think if you deal with that, um, this thing's going to be in great shape. So uh, really, really great composition. That's awesome. Nice job on this. Very cool. All right. Um, Palisades is working on uh, something's wrong with his Ableton today. He doesn't know what it is. He's living on the edge and trying to bounce. There will still be time. Awesome. Hopefully you get it resolved. That's always fun when you're trying to work and the dog crashes. It doesn't happen to me because I use Pro Tools. So it never crashes. Ever. It's getting better. All right, uh, let's see. So does anybody else have a track in the YouTube chat with me today? If you're here with us in the YouTube chat, uh, let me know if you have another song. I think we got through everybody that I saw in the chat. If you put your song in there and I missed it, let me know that as well. And in the meantime, I'm going to go on to a random one. So we're going to play a little roulette. Uh, this one was uploaded three minutes ago, Electric Noise. Let's get him started off right. Uh, all right, so he says, um, hey, crew, again, done pretty much everything myself here, apart from singing the lead vocal. Would appreciate any comments on the mix. Have I got the electric guitar, piano, drums at the end? Clarity, right? I'm feeling pretty good about it, and we welcome any feedback. Here we go. This is from Tommy, Tom Lloyd Goodwin. I want to let you know that I can have a heart like a lover. I want to get it right, but I know I will get it wrong. I want to speak my mind with lyrics that are smooth and unbroken. When liars and cheats sing in tune. Here I go again, I'm pissing on your chips like a divvy. I drink a little bit and then I see my words on the floor. So what am I supposed to do to bring you back to the sweetness When all my mistakes fill the room Give me electric noise to fill this void A simple sign of your happiness Because with just one look you swing that hook 
that puts me on the ground Give me electric noise to fill this void A simple sign of your happiness Because with just one look you swing that hook That puts me on the ground All I got is this money and a joke in my pocket So we can buy a drink and I can make you laugh if it works I know a place to go and no one ever knows If it's Sunday, well don't kick us out, it's too soon Give me electric noise to fill this void A simple sign of your happiness Because with just one look you swing that hook That puts me on the ground Give me electric noise to fill this void A simple sign of your happiness Because with just one look you swing that hook That puts me on the ground It puts me on the ground Man, that was extraordinarily bizarre because we saw the waveform dip off at the end, but everything stayed in there. Let me just refresh real quick because it was uploaded so recently. Maybe something changed. I don't think so. So, one more time. It puts me on the ground. Yeah, it's not changing. So, uh, I don't know what's going on at the end there. We'll just not worry about it. So I'm going to use Tommy's song to kind of go off on a little rant here for a second about, um, not a rant, like an angry rant, just like a, a happy rant, a thought rant, if you will. Um, but thinking about um, uh, some of my comments I'm about to make, I'll make the comments and then then we'll talk about it. Um, and this is also slightly based off of uh, Brad Heck. Um, we were talking about the snare drum in his song and uh, possibly using like EQ to pull it back a little bit. Um, Brad replied, so minus one dB at 4K, I'll try that too then. So um, the general comment that I wanna make, um, that's probably gonna work, Brad, that's that's awesome. Um, the general comment is uh, that, uh, no, Dana, I didn't see it. Uh, let me know if you could just uh, put your, put your uh, username and song that's up on Mixed Ink and, and I'll try to get to it. Um, we'll definitely get to it, it's gonna be awesome. Uh, okay, so uh, the thought was that a lot of times when we're we're mixing, um, especially in the beginning, uh, we're thinking about things like, uh, how do I make these guitars sound great? I want them to be in my face and, and detailed and all that stuff. Um, and then uh, with vocals, we're like, okay, I need to control it. Maybe maybe I saw somewhere like an 1176, a, you know, five to seven dB is going to sound great. And then the snare... The drums, I want them to be big and powerful. So I'm going to make those big and powerful. And we're thinking about these things in individual, the context of individual elements um, and less about the song and the overall picture. And um, Tom Lloyd Goodwin's here, uh, his mix here is not not like a terrible mix. I'm not, not saying that at all. And I'll, I'll comment on the actual mix in a second here. But um, thinking about uh, where do these things actually sit? And I think of my... Um, stereo image as a canvas right so everything that i'm listening to it's it's a canvas and i'm painting on it so it's in the beginning for me um i'm thinking about how important is the vocal how important are the lyrics uh for like that's coming through on the vocal what are the elements of the song the genre obviously plays into it if it's a death metal track the drums are going to sound a certain way if it's a folk track they're going to be another way all of those things um but i'm seldom thinking about like when i hear something I'm going to boost this much at this certain frequency point, or um, I'm going to do parallel compression on these drums because I know that that makes my drum sound awesome. And I always use the API 2500 as my drum bus compressor because it's punchy and it's, it's slapping. So I'll do that right away. I'm not thinking about any of that stuff. It's, it's more about like, let me listen to the song, find out what the emotion is, see where the emotion goes dynamically. Uh, as it progresses through the song, like, is there a big buildup at the end, a bridge, that kind of stuff. And then I'm thinking about like crafting that piece. So, um, 
I typically do like what's called like a top down approach where I'll I'll kind of get a balance going on everything. Um, I've usually got, you know, one or two tone pieces happening on my stereo bus, but usually it's just like a back CQ that's just doing a little lift and a little, you know, cut or whatever. It's not like I don't have, you know, a bunch of processing heavy on the stereo bus. And then I'm kind of going through listening to the song, then choosing like what is what are the main elements of the song that are kind of driving the train along. So I'll find like the main melodic instrument, the vocal. If it's a song like this, I would probably start with those acoustics and the vocal, or I'd put together the drum piece at the end a little bit. That's like a loud section, so I probably wouldn't there. But I'll put the, I'd probably start out with the vocal and making that thing sound great and intimate and making sure that I've got, you know, that sort of situated. And then I'll start bringing other things up around it because, um, not having that vocal there might cause me to do something like I'm going to make the drums sound epic or these acoustics sound so bright and detailed and in, in your face and everything. And then you put the vocal in and there's less importance on it because you've got all of this sparkle and everything on the acoustics. So I guess what I'm trying to say is um, instead of thinking about like processing moves or things that we do, the individual sound, instead of thinking about like, okay, I've got these elements on my canvas, how do I make them shine? How do I build this overall soundscape without making it all kind of crazy? So um, I'm gonna play it from back here and kind of given that thought, think about where the light's being shined on this mix, like what elements are being um, sort of, you know, put out and brought into the front, um, where the lead vocal sits, what's the importance of it, what is actually driving the song, just, Ask some of those questions while I play maybe another minute of this mix. Here we go. When all my mistakes fill the room Give me electric noise to fill this void A simple sign of your happiness Because with just one look you swing that hook That puts me on the ground Give me electric noise to fill this void A simple sign of your happiness because with just one look, you swing that hook that puts me on the ground. All I got is this money and a joke in my pocket. So we can buy a drink and I can make you laugh if it works. I know. So just on that last section, the last, you know, six bars or so that I played, um, everything feels important to me in that. And as the saying goes, if everything's important, nothing's important, right? So uh, the guitars are as detailed and as forward and processed as the lead vocal is. The cymbals coming in, they all they are very much up front. They're bright. They're close to me. And working in solo, you might be like, those sound great. Uh, but then inside of the context of the mix, do they need to feel as forward as the vocal does? Um, the other thing I'm hearing here is a lot of overcompression on the vocal where it's sitting parked in a, in a spot, but it's not moving naturally. So as he goes from like a softer singing tone to his louder chorus vibe, it's not really moving in the mix at all for me. It's just kind of parked and it feels like he's hit a, a governor on an engine or hit a brick wall. And it's just kind of saying like, no, you don't go past here. Um, despite how hard you sing. So it steals some of the emotion out of the vocal performance for me. Um, but overall, individually, I could see how all of these tones would sound great. It's just in the context of the soup, everything sounds um, very detailed and, and hi-fi, uh, which adds less depth um, to the picture. So uh, yeah, the yeah, a little bit, Kenneth. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically the thought there is just like, how do we create depth? How do we paint in the picture and, and paint around the important elements and uh, making our moves less about uh, which EQ do I boost and what band and what number is that? It's just turning the knob until it feels like it's fitting in context of the rest of the picture. Um, I think that those things uh, kind of help. And I also think it's a lot more fun to mix when you stop worrying about um, what's the best compressor for this or what's the right ratio or, or all of that stuff. Like just playing with knobs and not worrying about the numbers and, and just making it until it's like, oh, that, that feels right and it's in context and it's complementary to the other elements that I've decided are more important. So uh, hopefully that's worth something. That was a big, big rant for me. But overall, 
I think that this sounds really good. There were a couple um, tuning spots that I think could use some work. Uh, you have Melodyne in your Pyramix account. Uh, if you go up to the upper right, click on your username, then go to plugins and licenses. Melodyne is one of the ones that's in there. So you could use that to just kind of pull some of the vocal notes up a little bit. They just felt like they were sagging in spots, especially on the louder parts that get a little higher in the register. Uh, so that could help. Okay. Um, Okay, so Dana Cross is Haywired Audio. Song is Forgiveness. Let's check it out. Sweet. Thanks for submitting, Tom. I hope that was useful. All uh, right, so this is Haywired. Okay, Forgiveness. I'll kick on HD, and here we go. <laughs> Roads in my life, a life that's quickly passing by. I wish I never felt so troubled. Guess I got my reasons why. I try to be a better man, better than I was before. I've done a lot of soul searching. Can't go on this way no more I hear there's freedom and forgiveness If I can only find a way To unburden myself from a life I chose And move on from yesterday Oh, there's nothing that I can do over
Awesome. Thanks for submitting that, Dana. That's great. Uh, very cool track. The um, main things that jumped out at me. So you asked about uh, the easy drummer sounding artificial. So um, listening through it, I actually thought it's pretty good for for a product called Easy Drummer. Like that sounds that sounds pretty good and convincing. Um, I've got a tip for you on uh, reducing some of the artificial sound. Uh, that I'll talk about in a second, but I want to play a little piece of this at the end and have you listen to it. Um, before I play it, uh, there are a couple things that, that jump out to me in the mix, but the first one is the overall loudness of it. So it says here the track status is a master. This is a mastered version of the song. Uh, with that in mind, the snare to me is the loudest thing in the mix, um, which really puts it out in the open to say, that's a sampled snare or that's a virtual drummer, um, that kind of thing. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But as we play out, so one, listen to the balance of the snare and the rest of the track. The same with the kick, but not as much with the kick. Uh, and check out the hair, the snare in relation to the hi-hat. So on the hi-hat, I hear more room sound. I hear it a little further back from um, the front of the mix and uh, it has some depth around it. The snare drum feels like it's all of the close mic right in front of my face. So check out the difference between the hat and the snare, and then as we fade out, listen to the balance of the snare drum. So as everything else is coming down, is the snare drum coming down too? Check it out. So as that limiter kind of releases, yes, the snare drum is coming down, obviously, because it's a fade, but you kind of hear the rest of, you know, if the music's here and the snare is up here with it, the the music kind of goes like this and the snare stays parked and then they all kind of start moving backwards, right? So the, uh, the limiter was clipping off the snare even more than um, where it was in the mix. So uh, I'm guessing that you mixed into a limiter or into a uh, bus compressor that as the fade out happened, it was getting less signal into it and crossing the threshold less, except for that snare drum being right there. So um, something to look at there. The uh, the balance of the snare drum is the other thing that was tipping me off that it's a virtual drummer. And one thing that can help you with that, I'm going to go over to PureMix here. And the good news is it's free because you're a PureMix member. So if you click on your name up there and you go to manage profile, and then over on the left, you go to plugins and services. This is all the stuff that's included with your Pyramix account. You guys have access to all these plugins. Um, up here on the right is UVI's drum replacer. And I think I did a plugin, a uh, great big plugin show episode on this. And uh, it is by far my favorite drum replacer on the market. One of the cool things that you can do with it is you can make what's called round robin samples uh, or like sample triggering. So it's a sample replacement plugin that you could put this on Easy Drummer, and even though it's a sampled snare drum, if you put this on the snare track, you could load in uh, the snare from Easy Drummer, you could load in a couple other snares on it, and those could have slight variations to them. You could also do different velocity hits, like if you made some samples yourself of the Easy Drummer kit, you could just do different velocities and uh, where you get like a slight tonal change. You could put them in here and then have it round robin. Um, or if you bring in some that are from another library, outside of just sounding like a different snare, you have to be careful of that. It has an intelligent pitch matching thing on it. So if you bring in another snare and it's much lower tuned, you can hit the auto pitch thing and it'll pitch the sample up to the same pitch as the original sound, which is amazing and it makes for more transparent replacement. So I would definitely check out Drum Replacer from UVI free license in your Pyramix account, and I would play around with that. If you add some more variation to it, 
not saying it should sound like a different snare on every other hit, but if you add some more variation to that tone, I think it would help out a little bit. Um, the other thing that'll that'll really help out hiding that that's a, a fake drum set is just watching the level in the mix of it. So I would probably tuck those back into the mix a little bit more and, and not make them so out front, uh, but have it be a little bit more of the picture. Um, if those were back in the mix a little more, I don't think I would have even thought anything of it being a virtual kit. I would have just thought it fit the track. All of the other tones sound amazing to me. It sounds really, really good. The uh, You have some vocal processing on there doing like a doubler effect or something that feels a little heavy handed and maybe it steals a little bit from the intention of the vocal or the song from it. But it's also a matter of taste at that point and, and up to you to make the decision. But yeah, great job on this though overall. Um, I thought the mid range of the track was really good. The balance of the instrument was really good. Um, if you needed to pop that vocal forward, some parallel compression could help. Maybe loosening the compression on the vocal a little bit would, would help it be a little more natural too. But I think mostly just uh, working on the balance of the drums in relation to the rest of the song. And then, cool. All right. Great job. Okay, we got a couple more submissions, which is awesome. We got Greg Shoemaker submitted one. Um, we got uh, Jate Woe Music submitted a, a track. And let's check it out. So we'll go over to Greg's here. Greg's song is called Everything. Let's check it out. Okay. I'm going to pop on HG, and here we go.
that it's really okay Not to get what you need When you learn to look up Then you find everything Awesome, Greg. Thanks for submitting that. Uh, this track is a, it's listed as a master, um, and I'm definitely hearing the volume of the track. So uh, I feel like there's a lot of overall compression on the whole track. I feel like it happened in insert compression plus the mastering compression. I would wonder if a song like this needs to be mastered so hot. Um, I think like letting it breathe and be a little more dynamic might help out with the, the overall vibe and the um, having like a more laid back emotion to it. Sometimes when things are so loud like this, they feel aggressive. And while you're trying to create this like beautiful, serene, kind of relaxed state, um, over compressing it and bringing all of that low noise up makes things just kind of feel like they're loud and overwhelming and can pull away from that more relaxed feeling. So I'd watch out for the overall compression on it. Maybe the volume doesn't need to be that hot on the track overall. The snare drum felt like it had its transient clipped off to me a little bit. So like it was um, just pushing a new extreme compression or like there could have actually been a clip around it. Um, the uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was the the vocal on here. So um, the I'm hearing a lot of DSing and a lot of compression. And that compression is bringing up some of the imperfections of the recording. So uh, resonances that could have been caused either from proximity effect or the room that it was in. It might have just, uh, you know, sometimes when you sing a certain note, it'll excite the room. And if the mic's in the right position in the room, it'll excite the mode of that, you know, spot in the room and kind of cause this like low end resonance stuff. Compressing it brings that stuff up um, a little bit more and makes it more apparent sometimes and can cause like a muddy feeling vocal. So if I play back here just a little bit, we'll listen to the vocal and uh, I want you to listen to the bottom of the vocal. So like below 300 and just for any kind of like kind of sounds that are happening. The ones that we made Your hope and you try to believe let me go to a verse where it's a little bit more out there in the lower register a price that we pay so on we you can kind of hear one of those jump out on we price that we pay and i don't know if that's coming through on the youtube algorithm or not or uh through the youtube compression i mean um but yeah, I'm just kind of hearing some resonances pop out in the low mids there. So you could do a little bit of low mid cleanup before hitting compression like that if you really wanted to go for that level of compression. Um, but I think even letting the vocal breathe more would would kind of add to the emotion of the song and uh, the general feeling. There's, um, you know, kind of with, with what I was talking about earlier, there's a, a section in Michael Brower's latest video um, f uh, where he's mixing a Ben Abraham song. And he talks in the beginning as he's listening to the rough mix about all the things that he's hearing in the rough, the emotion of it, what's the story of it, um, what you know, state of mind is the, the person in the story in. Is it aggressive? Is it angry? Or is it um, subdued and sad and laid back or serene and peaceful? And then he just kind of talks about like 
how that guides all of the decisions that he'll make for the rest of the mix. Um, and it's it's less about, you know, even though Michael Brower's um, entire Browerized thing is built around uh, what are the coolest technical ways to achieve like this parallel compression technique. And it's an extraordinarily complicated setup, but he's not thinking that way when he's mixing. He's still focused on the story and, and delivering the emotion that was there in the song. Um, so that's that's one to think about. I think if this was a little less um, uh, hyped up, it would it would deliver the original intention a little bit better. Um, but overall, I think this is really good. My last uh, comment on it was that the vocal is um, dark in comparison to some of the other stuff. And the stuff that is very bright is some of the, the wind chimes and the percussion. Um, all of those have a lot of top end and they're very sparkly and beautiful, beautifully detailed uh, recordings of all of that stuff as well. It gives the illusion that the entire recording is brighter than um, what's actually going on underneath. So if you muted all of that stuff, I think that the, I think, I don't know, but like, I think if I heard this with all that stuff muted, I would think that this track might be a little muddy is not the right word, but a little dull and maybe a little bit um, muddy or muddy in the low mid range uh, because of that vocal, some of those resonant things that are happening. So the thing to watch out for here is if you have high elements of the mix that are making it feel really bright, um, those either need to be matched with other elements, meaning like the top end of the vocal could come up and feel like it's along the same plane as those. Uh, or you can chill those things out a little bit and bring them back to the other, um, to the level of the other instruments. So, and I'm just talking about tonal shaping on the top end of those uh, percussion tracks there. So um, high cuts are good, Taking a high shelf and dipping it and rolling it back a little bit can can be more transparent than that and not make things feel like they lose all their detail. But I think some of the top end of those things could be brought back a little bit and come closer to the um, the top end shape of the rest of the record, the rest of the tracks inside of the record. So I hope that that's useful. Um, very cool. And I think, yeah, the song's great and this is a mastered thing. So it, it could be thoughts for the next one. But thank you so much for submitting it and uh, for having it. And I hope that that's useful. Uh, great. Okay. Um, awesome. Let's see. So let's see if I got any other ones. I think I saw somebody. You got me is one that's up here. You got me. Let's see. It says, uh, this is from Jatewo Music. And in the comments, he wrote, you got me dash mix dot MP3. I don't think see anything for you got me. Um, let me try your YouTube username. If you have a uh, pure mix username, let me know that and it'll make it easier for me to find J Whoa music. So yeah, different username than YouTube. So that's cool. Uh, let me know, uh, inside of there. Palisades is at 30% uploaded. Awesome. Nice man. Okay. Let's pick another. Oh, here we go. There's one from Nick DeGrange. Uh, thank you for submitting. Awesome. So this is going to be unsettled. Guys, if I've missed you in the comments uh, with your song, please uh, remind me one more time in there. This is from Belinda Bowman, and this is Nick DeGrange's mix. This is a quick mix done for a mixing competition website. I worked on it for six hours or so, so I consider this an early revision. Okay, awesome. Here we go. Why is it so hard to be? sure of anything cause from what I've seen things as a teen sure aren't easy surrounded by those who seem to know where they're heading in truth no one knows and we all keep moving I'm so unsettled Yeah, I don't know myself But I'm convinced I'll make it out alright Yeah, I'm so unsettled Yeah, I don't know 
promise this won't last for long That's what they say But hey If you're feeling down some days That's totally a-okay Take it from me Yeah, it's something I see And I know where you're coming from And I promise this won't last for long Maybe just for a day, yeah I'm so unsettled Yeah, I don't know myself Yeah, I don't know myself But I'm alright Yeah, I'm so unsettled Ooh. Awesome, Nick. Great job. Uh, there is a lot of good stuff happening in here. So, um, one, I love your dynamics on it. That that feels really great. I want to check out the uh, intro leading into the first section here. Here we go. Know where they're heading In truth, no one knows And we all keep moving Yeah But I'm convinced I'll make it out so one of the things that I love a lot is on the intro of this, I feel like I'm listening to um, the, not a demo, it still feels like it's, you know, obviously professionally recorded and all that, but um, I feel like I'm listening to a person playing a guitar in a room and it feels very natural and awesome. And then um, the drop that happens, uh, it's, uh, we'll talk about the drop that happens in a second, but as the song goes on forward, now the vocal is more, um, more Hollywood, right? Like it's more uh, sounding like it's inside of a, uh, a professionally produced record. I love, um, I, I like to call these like scene changes or think of them as scene changes in a movie. As you're going from section to section, doing something to keep the interest going and tell the story better. Um, so I love how that kind of goes from like the singer by themselves to this more developed thing that, that kind of grows and, and builds up. Um, one thing that I wanted to hear happen was this thing. I kind of wanted this feel to come back on the bridge, which the arrangement of it is almost doing that. Uh, so let's listen to the bridge. That's what they say. But hey. Versus the intro. Surrounded by those who see. So on the intro, we've got a mono guitar. It's panned almost right up the middle with the guitar um, or with the vocal, just like you're listening to it in the room or like it's coming through, you know, one mono kind of thing. It might be a little offset, but it doesn't matter. On the bridge, uh, we've got the doubled acoustics and the vocal still has its um, extra compression from when the rest of the band was in the track. Uh, and it would have been cool to hear that collapse down more. That would be an arrangement decision. Um, but it's one, if I were, you know, if I got the multi-track for this, I'd probably take that chance and get rid of the double guitar and I would go back to the smaller feeling thing to let everybody breathe, have it come back down, focus on the singer songwriter thing and then let it blow back up at the end. Uh, so that's that's all taste and preference or whatever. But it was it was just a thought I had. The uh, the thought that I wanted to come back to on the beginning is that when this intro hits, um, while like the dynamic bump is awesome, it might be a little extreme if you were um, just kind of listening to the song passively and then all of a sudden it jumped up three or four db that if it's too much it can cause the person to reach for the volume dial and bring it back down if it's the right amount they'll leave it parked where it is and they'll just start grooving with it so that's something to think about is like those moves are really fun it's really easy to go too far sometimes too not that you should hold back all the time but there you go uh okay let's see um let's see what else we got on my notes here uh, the vocal felt like the, um, top of it could open up a little bit. Mostly I'm thinking after the band comes in, she feels a little bit muffled to me. Um, and doesn't have like that sparkly top that would kind of scream like lead singer on this one. Um, not a ton of top end, just kind of opening up the top of it. Uh, I like using Poltex for that kind of thing or like a back CQ or just a gentle shelf that's very broad just to kind of open up the top and add a little bit of clarity, especially as those cymbals and everything come in. Uh, the tom build on, or the toms on the build coming out of the bridge 
felt like they were out in front of everything and just kind of exposed, I would consider like pulling those back and seeing like what if I was, you know, looking at a picture of this, where do those things live? Um, to me, they were out front a little bit much and, and asking for too much attention uh, versus what was happening in the song. The ride symbol um, on the end and in those louder sections, the overheads feel like they're wide panned, um, which uh, totally valid decision. They felt like they were a little bit loud and that whole ma that made the sides of the mix pop out in front of the center uh, and made me lose a little bit of attention on the center of the vocal. Uh, the only other thing is a totally, again, a taste thing, just vocal effects. So um, sometimes you want to have just a nice tight dry vocal like you have here. And I love when I hear stuff like that. Um, but there are some things that you can do to add around it to make it feel like it congeals with the rest of the track without making it feel like a vocal wash. So um, a couple of my favorite things, uh, just using delays in place of reverbs, like short, tight delays that you're not really focusing on. You're not hearing the the top end spatter of them. Um, I love using uh, Echo Boy and I think like the DM2 is like a mono delay that I put up under the vocal almost all the time um, with like a tight, like usually like a 16th or something like that. I'll blend it up underneath. Not so I'm hearing the slap of the vocal. Um, I just do it until I hear the vocal just move forward ever so slightly and it, it doesn't feel like it's um, as exposed and it just kind of blends into the track a little bit more. I also love um, stereo slap delays, just again, like dark stereo slap delays that aren't loud. I don't even really want to hear them. I just want to feel the vocal congeal with the rest of the track. Um, but yeah, that's all I had. I thought this was really great and uh, a really nice job. I had good luck on the mix competition that you entered into. I hope you do well on there. Very cool. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. So J let me know his song. So J2 is the pure mix username that we were looking for. So let's check this one out. And then we'll check on Palisades, see how that upload's going. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, I'm gonna make a couple comments uh, real quick right here. So um, the first impression was that the low end is getting a little bit woofy. And uh, this tells me that you might not be hearing the low end properly because there's a nice boost on it. You're going for like a darker round kind of tone thing on the bottom, I think, uh, which is there, it's just a lot of it. And then there's a little bit of masking happening between the bass and the kick drum. So we're not hearing one of the other uh, when the other one's happening basically. So mostly the bass is masking the kick. I'm not getting a lot of punch out of it. So just a little bit of clarity, cutting maybe like around 180 um, hertz like in uh, in the bass guitar and making some room down there for the kick drum to be able to poke through a little bit more. The snare feels a little bit muffled to me. It's kind of um, in the back and it's, it's not letting me get the back beat that's happening inside of that groove, which I think is really important for this. Um, so low end shaping and then just getting that snare to crack a little bit and emphasize the groove of the track um, and making sure, yeah, the bass thing that is masking the kick, if that has less of a low end bump in it, 
and a bloom to it, uh, we, you should hear the the pulse of the song kind of step forward a little bit, and that'll that'll help the whole thing kind of groove better. Um, vocal sounds a little bit DS to me, over DS. Like some of that stuff is getting a little bit lispy. And then the other thing is that the electric guitar over on the right has a lot of high mid range, like like three K ish stuff. That when he really gets into the um, kind of scatty guitar thing that pops out of the forward and pokes my ear a little bit and it feels brighter than the rest of the mix. So I would consider um, either adding some body to that guitar or tucking the, the upper mids back a little bit or just putting a compressor with a faster attack on it. Um, I usually go for those things with EQ first and then if I need to control the dynamic, I will. That guitar sounds like it's going to need a little bit of compression because it's very dynamic. So going from there, here we go. me you got me feeling so high i should have moved much faster on it anticipated for the greatest ask me once ask me twice ask me anything you like did she break your heart did she do it twice i ain't Sounds almost like two drummers or there's a delay on the drums. I love delays on drums. You might want to tuck them back a little bit so it doesn't mess with the groove on it. And uh, the guitar sounds like it does have compression on it. It's just that that 3K stuff is escaping. So I might work on that with EQ. Uh, here we go. And I love the uh, the filtered trumpet thing that's happening on the left side there too. Um, it might need to get a little bit of its low end back, like if you just pulled that filter back just a hair, uh, just to match what's going on with the guitar. It felt really thin, making it not as important to me. And arrangement-wise, when it came in, it was adding another musical uh, motif, if you will, uh, while the electric that was sticking out was just doing its uh, rhythm thing that it had been doing for the past couple minutes. So. I'd make more of a moment out of that out of that sax. Um, and just a little bit of low mid coming back would help with that. That kick and bass relationship is going to be a tricky one because it sounds like the fundamental uh, of the kick is right where the root of the bass is and they're sitting on top of each other. So you might have to make some decisions. Side chaining is also an option. You could have the bass duck a little bit whenever the kick hits. Maybe that'll help a little too. But um, yeah, overall, this is really cool and it's got a vibe. Um, just to accentuate the, the great things that are already there, like the groove of the players and, and the vibe that's going in the track as it is. So great job. Thank you so much for submitting it. Awesome. I hope that that's useful. Awesome. All right. Uh, so we have a track from Palisades. Awesome. All right. Uh, here we go. Complex Dro, work in progress. He got it to work. He got Ableton to come back so that he could submit his mix. Everybody give him a round of applause. All right. Uh, this is my first attempt at producing a complex stro. Complex stro. I haven't heard this genre yet. Complex stro. Electro house track. The biggest challenge for me is selecting and balancing all of the right elements while still highlighting the chaotic style that is a characteristic of a complex stro song. I've never heard a complex stro song. So this will be great. I won't be able to comment on arrangement stuff. This is my first introduction to it. So, all right. Here we go.
going to comment here. I know it was about the drop and I killed the drop. Oh my God, I'm sorry. That was awful of me. Um, right here, that whoosh thing was getting a little bit harsh. If you want somebody to crank it, take back some of the harshness on that, on these, uh, the white noise sounds that are happening here, especially before that drop that I just stopped it right before. Wasn't that terrible of me? It's like the whole energy is gone now. Just kidding. Here we go. thing sounded like a dentist drill it just gave me flashbacks um awesome cool so uh that was my first complex show experience that was incredible um, <laughs> very cool so i imagine that that's a lot of fun to produce because it's just like making all those all those crazy sounds and everything um so you said that it's an early mix in the track status so uh i think it's it's on the way there's a lot of good stuff happening in the clarity of all of those elements up top um outside of the low mids and everything just everything that's happening in the upper mid range and all that is very cool it is a little bit harsh um like that one thing that i pointed out as it's going on there's just there's a lot of sounds that happen that are just kind of peaking in the upper mids that that would pierce your ear a little bit and make it not as enjoyable and then like i said before if you want people to crank this up if it rips their head off they're going to reach the other way with the volume instead of like getting the powerful punchy low end that needs to be dialed in a little bit um so watch out for that top one of the uh interesting things is so many people are listening to music on these guys these days right like these apple airpod guys it's a tiny little driver um these things the newest version of them i actually don't hate uh which is a sparkling review right it actually sounds really good to me and for the first time I've been like, oh, if that's what everybody's going to listen on, I don't actually hate that. So I like the Gen 2 AirPod Pros. These ones aren't bad either, but the, the new ones are, are pretty nice. But I would recommend getting a pair of something like that. It doesn't have to be those. Um, you could even do like cheap gas station earbuds or whatever. But that's if you put those in and then listen, you're going to experience a, a level of pain that's going to cause you to make different decisions on the, the upper mid stuff. Um, so if you're not getting it from the speakers, then that that would be a good reference point for you to check. You don't want to stay on those because you could pr you overcompensate very easily, um, but it would definitely show you what's kind of going on there. And and also, how are other people going to hear this? It's either going to be through the monophone speaker or through like AirPods or something small like that. So um, just check it out and, and see what you could do to the top end of the track. 
on the bottom end of the track, I'm going to go back to a comment that I said earlier about watching out for the groove. Um, as we compress things or um, add low end to things, it changes the the transient response of everything that's happening down there. And that's the pulse of our music, right? So if the, the low end has too much sustained, or sorry, if the kick drum has too much low end sustain on it, and it's not matching to the tempo of the song, um, or the bass, uh, the sub bass, if you boost up a bunch of subs on that thing, sub frequencies are very, very slow. And if they extend over the next note or extend over uh, what's happening with the kick drum's groove, it's going to kind of mess up the bottom of it and it's not going to slap as hard as the kids say it, that make complex drum music. Um, so watch out for the groove in the bottom end of the song. And I would consider um, you could mute all of those extra elements that are going on. Just focus on the kick and bass relationship and or like the drums and the bass. Solo those up and get them to like really lock in on the groove so that the groove is making your body move. Um, and not feeling like it's kind of, uh, you know, flabby, if you will. Um, yeah, other than that, the, the, the bass sound, the bass synth feels like it's very focused on low mid sounds and there's not a lot happening in the mid range of it. I would try to get some more frequencies in the mid range that are going to help with clarity and letting us hear the notes a little bit better. There was a specific spot of the song. I think it was around two minutes, maybe. Um, where the bass was a little bit more featured. It was more important harmonically than just as a feeling kind of thing. And I felt like I couldn't really hear the note. So watch out for the um, just EQ balance on the on the bass. But I think a little bit more mid-range is going to help you come through on the phone speaker and the AirPods and um, overall on, on it. So yeah, watch out for the harshness. Uh, get the low end groove and nice and um, add some more sounds. There's not really enough in there. So put some more in there. I'm <laughs> just kidding. I have, I have no idea what the genre calls were, but it's fun to listen to that stuff for sure. Definitely dig it. Um, okay, so he says, uh, uh, I also use different sidechain volume curves for different instruments, so I need to make sure things are really aligned properly too. Yeah, if you're using automated sidechaining stuff, it's all got to be breathing together. Um, try to get those same things across multiple elements. Awesome. Uh, yeah, Brad, me too. That was a heck of a production. Great job, Velocades. Thanks for for uh, getting the Ableton stuff figured out so you could submit for it because it was fun to listen to. Guys, let me know if I've missed anybody in the comments. Um, and I'm going to just uh, remind everybody. Wait, Brad X says, I'm having Complextro t-shirts printed and naming my next dog that. Complextro, the dog. That's awesome. Okay, uh, over on the video side of Pure Mix, Again, we got the new uh, Luca Predalesi mixing Diplos Don't Forget My Love video. That's out now. Definitely go check that out. It's a killer video. I learned a lot from it while we were making it, and uh, I think it's more than worth watching. Um, really, really great stuff that's happening inside of it. If you happen to miss it, we had Michael Brower deconstructing Friendly Fire. I talked about this earlier about Michael listening to the rough mix and, and really kind of going into what he extracts from that and how it informs the rest of his mix uh joe ciccarelli the districts do it over again great video from joe he's just an amazing producer and uh this is at his room at sunset it was a really fun one to make and then the master jean-marie horvat mixing robin thick's look easy uh is out now too jean-marie is amazing he starts with vocals in his mix so he he does the vocals first and then brings everybody up around it and uh he's just a great presenter too he's really fun to watch so I hope that that is all useful stuff, guys. Thank you so much to those who submitted their mixes today. Um, it was a great welcome back. All the sounds are incredible. The mixing, like the quality of the mixing is just going up through the roof and it's, it's amazing to see everybody's progress. And yeah, thank you so much for submitting stuff. It was a lot of fun today. Um, if you have any questions, mark at puremix.net. I'll do my best to get back to you as quickly as I can. Uh, and it's been a blast. So until next time, guys, I'll see you then. Bye.